We earlier introduced the idea of a dipole, which is simply a positive charge separated from a negative charge. And now we want to actually think about the electric field that a dipole is going to create. Now, we might have induced dipoles like this, where it's originally a neutral atom or neutral molecule that's been stretched by an electric field. Or you can have permanent dipoles, such as a water molecule. So when you're thinking about how to work with dipoles, once you understand how to calculate something, it can apply to either of these cases. And you should expect to see problems where either of these things are true. When we want to do a calculation with dipole, we are frequently going to use a quantity called the dipole moment. And that is this vector p quantity. And when we have a dipole, a simple way of thinking about it are two point charges. They need to be equal in magnitude. A dipole doesn't exist if they're not equal in magnitude. So we have a positive q and a negative q, where those are literally the same q. And they are separated by a distance s. Now, this isn't a good model, for instance, for a water molecule. But we're going to create this quantity called a dipole moment out of this simple model. And when we do have a more complicated dipole, like a water molecule, we can still actually determine its dipole moment and then use that in, in calculations. So again, we're going to use a simple way of calculating this or defining it, but the dipole moment is actually a more general quantity that can be determined for any dipole. So all this is then, the magnitude is going to be the amount of charge multiplied by the separation. So it is a vector and it points from negative to positive. Now note that that isn't just, well, is it this way or that way, it's actually a vector in three space or in the 2D plane in this case. So keep in mind that this has a two dimensional or a three dimensional direction and it's not just along the dipole, it's specifically from negative to positive. So how you get a bigger dipole moment is either by having more charge, so a larger magnitude negative charge, a larger magnitude positive charge, again equal in magnitude, or by taking the same charge and separate them, separating them. So there are two different ways to get larger dipole moments. And again, we use p with the vector symbol because this is a vector. Lowercase p has come up in mechanics when we did momentum. I can't think of a situation where you're likely to have a calculation with both the dipole moment and momentum, but you'll want to think about how to do your um, notation clearly if you do ever have that scenario. So now let's try to think through what's actually happening with our fields. And after we think about field lines, it's going to be more easy to visualize this. So right now we're just using our previous technique of taking a point in space, so for instance this one, and then looking at the electric field from one point charge and then looking at the electric field from the other point charge. Again, doing the math for every single point in space is actually a much more complicated problem than what we can do in uh, intro physics. So instead, we have two special places. One is on the axis, which means along the dipole itself. The other special one is the bisecting plane, which means it cuts through the middle of the dipole perpendicular to it. So we can effectively calculate the field along this line and along that line. Not at the same time. From a symmetry point of view, you want to do one or the other. You can't just set up one calculation um, in a straightforward way that does both. So on the axis is the simpler case to think about. So we'll start with that. And we know that this is going to be an electric field in the y direction. And this is from symmetry, that because all of the charges here and the point I'm considering lie on one line, you expect your electric field to be away and towards. So it's all going to be on the y direction. Now, I'm giving you the answer more or less here. The book goes through the exact calculation here, but what's important to recognize is that this y value is your position. And this is your position from the center of the dipole. S is then that spacing between them. So this hasn't been set up with the dipole moment uh, originally, but we can then actually convert the answer into having the dipole moment. But you get this fairly complicated form. Again, you can combine this together, but it doesn't really simplify. But we can say that we're in a case where we're far away 
on the axis. And again, dipoles in this picture, it doesn't look like we're much farther away than the spacing itself. But in a real scenario, you're typically fairly far away from the dipole compared to what the spacing actually is. So what we get to do in that case is simplify this. And again, the book goes through this in a little more detail, which I'm not going to do. But if we say that y is much, much greater than the spacing, we get to simplify this down to just be 2qs. Note that my q has gone inside. And we then on the bottom have y cubed. So this gave us, in a way, y to the fourth, but we had a y on top. Remember that qs is your uh, dipole moment. So even though we didn't do the calculation with the dipole moment, we get an answer that actually does have the dipole moment built in. y, remember, is your distance. So this effectively tells you that the distance is to the cubed power. This is quite different than for a single point charge where it was to the the two power, right, just squared. So another way to write this, as I've shown up here, is we can actually switch this to be a vector by using the direction of your dipole moment. Because remember, your dipole moment points from your negative to your positive. And so we don't have to just use the y-axis, but the y-axis actually aligns with our dipole moment. Even if we take this whole picture and rotate it a little bit, our y-axis is still aligned with the dipole moment. So the direction aligns with your dipole moment, and in that case we don't have to use y, we can generalize it to be r, where this is the distance from the center of the, um, the dipole, but this is still only on axis. This isn't for any location, this is only for this axis. Note that there's this factor of 2, which is again coming out of the original math and doesn't vanish in the simplification. So this is one of the two directions. The second one is more complicated when we look at the bisecting plane over here. The reason for that is that now we fundamentally have a two-dimensional problem, that the positive charge gives us both a y component and an x component, the negative charge gives us a y component and an x component. But you can see that their x components are going to cancel, because in this case the distance here, if, if I call this like r positive and r negative, those two distances are the same from symmetry. So the strength of the field from each of these is the same. In this first case, it wasn't the same because it's closer to one compared to the other. But here, the strength is the same, which means that those x components cancel, and you're just adding up that y component. So what do we get? Well, and I've just removed the other stuff for clarity, we actually have a minus sign here. And how you can see is that this is literally pointing down even though our dipole moment is still pointing up. So that's interesting and it will make a little more sense when we talk about field lines. So in this case we can again express that in terms of the dipole moment and it does still fall off as r cubed, but note that on the axis you have a factor of 2 and you don't have that factor of 2 here. So whether you're to the side of a dipole or kind of from the end of the dipole, being at the end of the dipole is stronger than being at the side and the direction is actually flipped. So these are two interesting results that you might use in other problems and again the book does go through the math, the, the algebra involved in it, in a little more detail.